Raising Arizona is a film written and directed by the Coen brothers that was released into cinemas in 1987. Over the years the film has been fondly remembered, and many reviews mention its light-hearted fun nature. However, there is a hidden dark side in Raising Arizona, and in this video I will reveal it. This video will focus on the meaning behind High's Woodpecker Tattoo, to answer the questions of who was Leonard Smalls, how does he connect up with High, and what type of future would Nathan Jr. have if he were the son of High. To give a brief summary of Raising Arizona, High, played by Nicolas Cage, is a serial criminal who falls in love with a police officer named Ed, played by Holly Hunter. The two marry and find out that they are unable to conceive. They decide to kidnap a baby and they find themselves pursued by a bounty hunter named Leonard Smalls, who was played by Randall Cobb. After a confrontation, they return the baby back to its original parents and they fall asleep questioning their actions and their marriage. Fade to black. One of the most iconic things in Raising Arizona is High's Woodpecker Tattoo. We can see it in many scenes through a rolled up sleeve or a singlet. The design is similar to Mr. Horsepower, which is a logo for the auto shop Clay Smith Cams, and it could simply be passed off that High is an auto fanatic. However, High never shows any strong passion for his car in the film, so I don't think that is the reason why he has it. In the American South, there is a white prison gang that called themselves Peckerwoods, and one of the symbols is a woodpecker tattoo. Peckerwoods believe in strength and unity, and through this there is an overt racism in their actions. I believe that in his first visit to prison, High joined the Peckerwood gang, and throughout the film he struggles to leave the prison gang life behind to commit to a family life and the real world. The first time we see High, he is having his mugshot taken. In this shot his sleeves are down, and we can't see his upper arm, so we can't tell if he has a tattoo yet. I believe that he doesn't have it yet, because in the following montage, after he has experienced prison life, we can see him purposely rolling his sleeves up and proudly displaying the tattoo and his affiliation. Now it would be very obvious to determine the meaning behind that tattoo if other inmates spotted it in the film. However, we aren't shown this, but we are given a very slight hint of High, Gale and Evel being in a Peckerwood gang together. This occurs when the two brothers break out of jail and they visit High late at night. We don't get to see High open the door, but we do get to hear their reunion, which infers that the importance is in what they are actually saying. We hear Evel say, <laughs> The very first thing that he says to High is by calling him an old woodpecker. This reinforces the idea that High is in a Peckerwood gang and his membership is a priority to the brothers. In reality, the identity of Peckerwood gangs is derived through their thoughts of supremacy over other races and hence racism. I believe that the Collins purposefully avoided obvious racism in the film so that the audience would be more sympathetic to High. In fact, in the film High doesn't associate with black people at all as he has no friends or colleagues who are black. There is only one time in the film that we do see him speak to a black person and this is when he is forced to in the confinement of his prison cell. Normally High is patient and polite, but in this interaction High is clearly annoyed with the babble and we can hear his disdain in his voice rather than sympathy. When there was no crawl there to be found, we ate sand. You ate what? We ate sand. You ate sand? That's right. Also, when he shares his cell with a black character, it's when he realizes... Yeah, the joint is a lonely place after lock up and last out. High might be referring to prison as a lonely place because he is separated from society. But by doing this, he has completely disregarded his cellmate's company and comradeship. I believe that he's ignoring his cellmate on purpose because of the Pickerwoods gang's racism ideal. What leads me to think that this tattoo is gang related is because High always covers it up when he's trying to make it in the outside world. We can see this when he hides it from the parole officers so that he can be released to marry Ed. At his job he wears overalls. At the adoption agency he wears a suit and when he meets respectable friends he wears a collared shirt with a sleeve down. These are all situations where it is not socially acceptable for him to have been in a prison gang. However, when he's at home with Ed or his prison friends, he is relaxing and he has his sleeve rolled up. It seems like High is a useless criminal as he continually gets caught. However, there are moments in the film where we see that he's not completely inept at stealing. And I believe that when he does get caught, he's doing it purposefully so that he doesn't have to deal with reality and he can go back to the gang in prison who are his de facto family. This is why he never brings a loaded gun, and why he always seems to bungle his crimes. After he is engaged to Ed, we think that he's a changed man for a bright future, and that he'll leave his criminal ways in the past. In his imagination, however, he still can only visualize Ed taking his mug shot, suggesting that he'll be back in prison soon again. Hyatt is an unreliable narrator, and his narration often conflicts with the action on screen. In fact, if you study him closely, you can see that he's an outright liar. There are times where we know for sure that he is telling lies. But there's a spirit of camaraderie that exists between the men, like you find only in combat, maybe. 
or on a pro ball club in the heat of the peanut drive. What's the matter? I'm sorry, honey. It just didn't work out. What do you mean it didn't work out? Well, they they started crying and No, the babies weren't crying at all. They're fugitives, huh? How are we gonna start a new life with them around? Well, no. Honey, you gotta have a little charity. You know, in Arab lands. Sit out of plate. Promise just a day or two. Tonight and tomorrow tops. Despite what Hai says, the two brothers end up staying longer, and this is the reason why Nathan is stolen from them. Biology and the prejudices of others conspired to keep us childless. Our love for each other was stronger than ever. At this point in the film, Ed can barely even look at Hai. Since they are unable to have a child, their marriage is in trouble, and they will most likely divorce unless there is a drastic change. There are other times where we can tell that he is lying, and this is revealed through his conflicting body language. Have you learned anything, Hi? Yes, sir, you bet. You wouldn't lie to us, would you, Hi? No, ma'am, hope to say. Okay, then. In that shot, we could see Hi rolling his eyes and sarcastically smiling at the parole officers. He is not telling the truth at all. As the narrator and protagonist of the film, Hai is only telling us what we want to hear, but instinctively we give him the benefit of the doubt. And this can be seen at the start of the film. Hai implies that the kidnapping was a shared idea, and that the couple arrived at the decision in unison. However, there are numerous moments where we can see that he was never on board with the idea at all. One revealing moment of Hai's true thoughts on the kidnapping can be seen at the end of the opening montage. It's an exciting scene, the music has been building, and in narration Hai has revealed a plan that will thrust the film forward. However, if we study his body language, we can really see what he thinks of the plan. Hai petulantly closes the door and sits in the passenger seat. This suggests from the onset that he doesn't want to go, he doesn't want anything to do with Nathan Jr, and is only committing to the kidnapping for other reasons. I believe that he is only doing it in hopes that it will keep his wavering marriage together. There are other instances in the film where we see that Hai doesn't care for fatherhood, nor does he care about Nathan Jr that much. When he watches the poorly behaved children, he replies, Shit, man! Listen up! What's the matter? Don't you get it? No, Glenn, I sure don't. When he is asked for Nathan Jr.'s name, in a panic he says, Say, that reminds me. What you gonna name it? Ed. Ed Jr. But I thought you said it was a boy. Logically, it would have made sense to name the boy after himself, but he instinctively has refused to take ownership of the baby. Later in the film, when he is offered to participate in the brother's crime spree, he says, Boys, it's kind of offer, but just guessing I'd just up and leave Ed. Well, that'd be pretty damn cowardly, wouldn't it? In this moment, Hai hasn't considered Nathan at all, and once again, it shows that he's not a priority in his life. When they are taking a family photo, it asks him for his commitment, and Hai's face is forever frozen in an awkward realization of his obligations. Now, you gonna help, aren't you? How's that, honey? Contribute to the management of the child. Just quiet evenings at home together. You can count on it, honey. Everything decent and normal from here on out. We're set to pop you, honey. When he goes to steal Nathan, he takes a painfully long time. In this scene, High once again wants to get caught, so that he won't have to be a father. There are a few indications of this in his dreams as well. In The Nightmare About Leonard Smalls, it subconsciously shows High's desire to be caught. Even though we know for sure High and Ed drove off with the baby, in this great shot we can see his car in the yard on the left waiting for the authorities. On the first night of having Nathan Jr., the two brothers bang on his door and he wakes up saying, Merry Christmas. We don't get to see this dream until the very end of the film, but in it Nathan Jr. has been returned to his parents. Already in the first night, High is having thoughts of returning the baby back to the Arizonas. There's a lot of evidence that Hai never wanted to be a father from the onset, and he probably only did it in hopes of stabilizing his marriage with Ed. It also seems like Hai wanted to be caught from the crime, and this is probably in hopes of delaying the inevitable divorce as long as possible. Now that we know more about Hai and his intentions, this leads to the questions of why does he not want to be a father, and what were his parents like? We can determine what type of parents Hai had by looking at the little hints given in the film. After Hai is robbed from a convenience store and is saved by Ed, he tries to justify his criminal behavior by saying, You know, honey, I'm okay, you're okay, 
that there's what it is. I know, but honey. See, I come from a long line of frontiersmen and, oh, here it is, dear, turn here. Frontiersmen and outdoor cops. I'm not going to live this way, huh? In calling his father a frontiersman, this sounds like a polite way of calling him an absent father who wasn't there or available to hire in his childhood. This is possibly because he too was spending time in jail. In this scene, Hi and Ed are trying to trick the brothers with a homecoming sign. Welcome home, son. Where's he been? Phoenix. Uh, he was uh, visiting his grandparents. They're separated. Oh, would that be your folks, ma'am? No, I'm afraid not. Well, I thought you said your folks was dead, H.I. Well, we thought Junior should see their final resting place. Even though we know Hi is lying to the brothers about the meaning of the sign, the film is implying that his parents were separated since they were buried in different graveyards. Since Hai most likely had an absent father, this explains why he now constantly turns to the option of prison to feel involved with the family, which is his gang. I've already established that Hai doesn't want Nathan at all, so it's not hard to see that Hai would probably follow in his father's footsteps and disappear for whatever reason, so continuing the long line of frontiersmen and absent fathers. Several of the characters in the movie want to claim Nathan as their own son, and to do this, they take ownership of the boy through his name. What's his name? Uh, uh, hi, um, hi, Junior, till we think of a better one. Say, that reminds me. What you gonna name it? Ed. Ed, Junior. But I thought you said it was a boy. So I guess we'll be calling the baby Glenn, Junior, from now on. <laughs> He's our little Gail, Junior, now. In this action, they are thrusting their own identity onto the child, and they are dictating how they want Nathan to develop. However, as high as Nathan's father for the majority of the film, we can see that the process of learned generational behavior between the two had already started to develop. We can see this through several symbolic connections. Some of these connections are, the site of the state prison that High routinely lived in is Florence, Arizona. This also happens to be the name of the mother that Nathan was conceived in. When Hai was having his first nightmare about Leonard Smalls, he wakes up to find that... Careful, right. Well, he's alright. He's just having a nightmare. The two characters were sharing a nightmare at the same time. It's also interesting to see that the comforting song that Ed is singing to Nathan was used as a theme of the background music in Hai's nightmare. This song is supposed to comfort Nathan, yet it torments Hai at the same time, and this suggests that Ed's love for Nathan is a real source of his nightmares. In the montage of High writing his letter, we can see several shots dissolve in and out of characters. In this shot, we see Nathan and High dissolve into each other. This symbolically reinforces that the two characters share a bond, and it may even suggest that they are replaceable with each other. This can be deduced because Nathan has usurped High's position in bed. Another film technique that shows the bond between the two is them sharing a similar camera angle. In these two shots, we can see them both being vulnerably dragged out from something. In these actions, they are starting to share the same experiences. Would Nathan have a bright future if he was the son of High? Most likely not. With the mentioned symbolic connections, it shows that Nathan and High share a bond. And in this bond, Nathan had already started his process of learning from High, and he would have joined the long line of frontiersmen. Furthermore, the film demonstrates Nathan's potential criminal future through the following quotes. He's a scandal. Honey. He's a little outlaw. No, he, 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 he's a good boy. He ain't too good, you can tell by that, that twinkle in his eye. We felt the institution no longer had anything to offer us. My lord, he's cute. He's a little outlaw, you can see that high. Both High and Gal recognize Nathan's criminal past in front of him. Also, later in the film, Leonard Small says, What a fine an outlaw you call an outlaw. In this quote, is he referring to catching High here, or catching the future outlaw Nathan? And even Dot recognizes this by saying, to what do you do? Just fly straight down from heaven. Well, you're going to send them to Arizona State. Is she referring to Arizona State School? Or could she be referring to Arizona State Prison? When Nathan first arrives to the domicile, there's a homecoming sign up for him. This can be connected up to when High says, I can't say I was happy to be back inside, but the flood of familiar sights, sounds, and faces almost made it feel like a homecoming. Nathan's new home will be his new prison, and he will learn how to behave under the gang leader High. Nathan's prison homecoming is even commemorated with a photo, and this is symbolically his very first mugshot. We can see that the family camera is set up like the one in the police department, and when the photo is taken, we see that Nathan has even turned to the right. 
No, it doesn't seem like there's a bright future for Nathan, and he'll most likely stumble into High's criminal path. This is because it's very likely that High will be in prison for committing another crime, and Nathan will perceive this as a natural course of events. But even if High manages to avoid the temptations of prison life, we can see that he still has the intentions of Nathan following into his Peckerwood gang. This is demonstrated through Nathan receiving his own symbolic woodpecker tattoo. Now of course he can't tattoo a baby, and the film doesn't show this. But instead, the film demonstrates High's intentions in this scene. In this scene we can see a blanket with a woodpecker on it right under High's chair. This blanket is intended for Nathan because of its colourful design, but also it's prominent in this shot where the director strategically placed it right next to the instructions for the baby. This blanket is High's instructions and intentions for Nathan. If he's going to be stuck with raising Nathan, he's going to teach him and normalise the goal of him joining a Peckerwood gang. Now that I've looked at High's family background and I've established his intentions in the film, I can address the question of who is Leonard Smalls? We don't know much about him, but we do know that he shares the same woodpecker tattoo as High, and it could be argued that he was a member of the Peckerwood gang who was released from prison before High entered it. This would explain why High apologises to him after he pulls the grenade pin. However, Lenny appears in one of High's nightmares before he meets him, and because of this his character is largely symbolic and we need to determine what he represents. I believe that Lenny is a physical embodiment of High's desire to leave parenthood and turn back to crime. Lenny is introduced into the film the same night High steals Nathan. High quickly realises his dread of fatherhood is correct, and this is further amplified when the two brothers turn up, reminding him of his gang. He soon falls asleep, and the narration over his dream is purposefully misleading, as he tries to trick us into believing that he wants to be a father, but we know that this is a lie. High is not actually scared of Lenny, but rather he's fighting the appeal of becoming Lenny. When he wakes up, he has a horrible day meeting respectable friends, and his urge for crime is too strong, and he turns back to robbing a convenience store. Ed saves him, but reprimands his actions. That son of a bitch. Still, the urge is there, and later that night, he decides to take up the brother's offer to return to their gang. And he writes a letter expressing his criminal desires and intentions to Ed. This is the very night that we see Lenny first approaching the domicile. On the surface of the film, Lenny should have logically have entered and taken Nathan then, yet he doesn't. This is because Lenny symbolically represents High's desires resurfacing. As High falls asleep writing the letter, we see a shot of Lenny resting and there's a baby crying in the background. This shot represents Nathan crying in the middle of the night and needing help, and High's newly returned criminal nature happily ignoring him. When day breaks, the plan falls apart almost immediately as the two brothers betray him. High decides to turn away from the Peckerwood gang and he wants to fight for Nathan and Ed. In the climax of the film, we see him physically fighting Lenny. His desire to turn back to crime is relentless and grabs him strong. We can even see his head being battered back and forth, just like when he was originally dreaming and trying to fight the appeal of Lenny. But in the end of this fight, High manages to defeat him and kill it. The reason why he wins this time is because in this fight he has a purpose of fighting for and protecting Ed. We can see Ed wearing her police uniform. This is unusual because at this point in time in the film, she wasn't a police officer. And also when she found out that Nathan was stolen from her, she was wearing a different outfit. Ed changes into her police uniform and this is a symbolic guide for High. If High wants to stay in his marriage and hence family life, he must choose to live his life within the law and must destroy his law-breaking behaviour, which he does. It seems like the film has been building up to a happy ending that we all want to see. Even though High and Ed's marriage is still troubled, this is still something that can be resolved. But when we study High's final dream, not everything may be as it seems. In the end, Nathan Jr. is returned back to the Arizona household, and High and Ed both go to bed questioning their marriage. We know that High is an unreliable narrator, so we can't be sure how much truth is in his premonitions, but he does imply that the two stay together and they have their own children. I do believe that, in him defeating Lenny, High has killed the criminal impulse within himself, but I don't believe that he stays married with Ed. I just want Nathan Jr. back safe. I know that. If we don't get him back safe, I don't want to go on living. And even if we do get him back safe, I don't want to go on living with you. Ed's opinion is so determined, and we can see that High is completely blindsided by it. It seems so unwavering, and I don't think that he'd be able to change it. Nor would Nathan Arizona's pep talk convince her to stay with a man that she no longer loves. Watch her reaction when High tries to explain their breakdown and calls her selfish. I think the wife and I are, are splitting up. 
Her point is that we're both kind of selfish and unrealistic. Furthermore, there is also the problem of her being barren, and this is another barrier to Haya's dream coming to fruition. I believe that Haya is having a dream about himself, but the lady in it isn't Ed. We never see her face in his dream, so she could be anybody. When Haya's future daughter enters, she acknowledges Haya's dad, but she skips saying mum, to whom we presume is Ed. Kids are the grandkids. And I don't know. This symbolically suggests that our presumption is incorrect, and the woman in front of us is not Ed. Near the end of the dream, the two stand next to each other and hug. In this shot, their height difference isn't that large. But if we look throughout the film, Hi and Ed do have a huge height difference. Also, one of the most unusual lines in narration is at the start of the film. I don't know how you come down on the incarceration question, whether it's for rehabilitation or revenge, but I was beginning to think revenge is the only argument that makes any sense. Perhaps the best revenge he could take is by settling down and having children with somebody else. I hope you've enjoyed my video. If you did like it, please rate, subscribe and share. Thank you.